this is November's Everyone Has a Voice, Everybody is Welcome. Uh, we hope we will be hearing some new poetry today. We'll have an open mic. We have our features in the house, Mr. Lewis Fox right here. And our student feature, Nyla Bedgood. We would like to thank the Brockton Public Library for giving us this wonderful space to read our poetry, to read our truths. Um, we also would like to thank Mr. Mark Lindy, the general manager of Brockton Community Access for recording this for future uh, viewing on Brockton Cable Access and YouTube. Um, this is a wonderful series. Um, as you can tell by the title of the series, it's called Everyone Has a Voice. We are here to speak our truths. Okay, whether it be internally, psychologically, our social commentary, this is where we talk, this is where we speak, this is where we communicate. Okay, everybody agree with that? Yeah. I think in this time of uh, our society, communication is um, lacking. And if we don't talk to each other, we will never find out what our feelings are, and that's very important. So to begin with that, we are going to have an open mic, so people from the audience will be coming up, doing two couple of poems. Um, as I said, they're speaking their truth, so this is a non-judgment zone, okay? So, we are going to start with the person who didn't want to go first, but that's the way it goes, Kate Flattery. Yeah. Thank you. Which one do I have to move, this one? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, raise your hands if you can't hear me, because it's no good if you can't hear it. Okay, the first poem I'm gonna read it needs a little bit of explanation. Um, I served in the Peace Corps in Malaysia, in a state of Malaysia called Sarawak, which is actually on the island of Borneo, and most Americans don't know too much about Borneo. Um, might have heard of the headhunters of Borneo. Um, well, I spent a lot of time in those villages of the ancestors of the headhunters, very remote. And since I was there from 67 to 69, I have two excuses. That's why I didn't go to Woodstock. <laughs> and I also didn't get to watch the moon landing on TV. There wasn't any TV in Sarawak at the time. And that's background to this poem, which is called Headman, 1969. It's about a gentleman that I had a nice conversation with one day, um, ahead of the longhouse in a remote village. He was the headman. Wisdom sat on his brow as a minor bird on the prow of his canoe. A true sign the gods approved the tattoo on his neck, the most elaborate and painful in the village. He knew the looping brown rivers as the veins on the back of his hand, knew where the watery elbows were swollen with fish he could catch in a basket, knew where the billion trees grew and the nipa palm for thatch. The wild boar, king cobra, and the crocodile had fallen by his parang. Each pathway through the swampy woods as changeable as clouds, his feet remembered. The exact moment to begin burning his field was a part of him. He knew the songs of his people had almost been a manang once. Knowing so many secrets of the dead, of the rivers and trees, of the power of the sun at noon, of the youngest child in his village, he could believe, as the radio said, that men had walked on the moon. Now, but a day's journey from home, he balks at the door of the metal box that wants to hold him in to carry him to the next floor. I thought that was pretty brave of him to admit that he was scared of an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, this is much more down to earth. Uh, it's called Home. Home is where you go with a boo-boo. From a cure chrome, a band-aid, and maybe a hug or kiss, it's sometimes a kind of bliss. It's where you go when the world's thrown everything at you, mud puddles and sleet, bad boys lobbing stones, a rip in your dress, your shoes a mess, a big dog barks in your ear. When you get home, there's nothing to fear. Home is a place where you don't have to mind your manners and put on a pretty face. It's just not that kind of place. It's where Ma's cooking daisy, ham, and cabbage. She doesn't even groan when you tell her you could smell it at the corner. She's just glad to see you home. It's just as easy as your fuzzy pink slippers. And if you have trouble with your zipper, your sister's there to help. That's home. If your homework turns your soul black with wrath, Big Brother Jack can help you with your math. That's home. And if Dad's grouchy when the news comes on, you let it go because you know he'll be better soon. He's home too. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Can we have an applause for the poem and the poet? Our next person for the open mic, please welcome um, Elaine Hapney. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be able to um, exhibit here. This is all my work, and I hope you'll sign my book. And also, there are some free um, books there from the arts journals uh, at UMass, if anybody would like them, beautiful poetry and art. <laughs> um, I was watching uh, a show on TV, and they were interviewing a comedian, a well-known comedian. And it was in California, and he was before a um, comedy club. And they asked him, hey, man, are you going to, uh, are you going to produce your act here or, or, or speak here? He said, no, man. He said, I used to love to come here to experiment with my work. But he said, now, one word, and you can lose your career. So this poem was inspired by that. Be careful what you say. We are subjected to look at horrors, violence, crude language, degradation of women on TV and movies every day. But now, in human conversation, we have to be careful what we say. Freedom of speech is a thing of the past. The right to speak has reached its peak. Use the right pronouns. Slow down. Censorship, a tool for hiding government-paid advertising. Political correctness, a prison where you are bitten with handcuffs. Every word sanitized, clean, with the poison of PC. Become a robot. Keep religion to yourself. Bound, gagged, imprisoned to be politically correct. Be silent, conform, conform. Like a thorn in my throat, I need to express to release my stress. I will start writing with invisible ink. <laughs> Lost in the matrix. The world is run by those you don't see. And docile slaves they make us be. Buy what you don't need. Be seduced by a lie. You must buy because you're not good enough. You're not thin enough, young enough, hip enough, old enough. By fashion, by big vans, the latest tech toys in walls of plasma TV. Do what they say and how we obey. Now we have debt, which we will regret. Self-esteem lost, we have been tossed lost in a virtual world, an illusion of choice, of connection, that becomes an obsession. 
distracted and brainwashed, isolates me from human, wake up from the matrix. I forgot who I was. The only thing worth a damn, the spirit and grace of the human race. Please look at my face. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thank you very much. And for your artwork, it's, it's lovely. Thank you. Another round of applause for the poem and the poet. OK, so we have a celebrity in the house, one name, Zoya. Walking with old friends. Walking with old friends on Long Island Beach. Blue all around. Salt in my nostrils. I can't stop picking small pebbles. Each unique and irresistible. Like the days of our youth. Sleeping senses come to life as the wind gently brings a taste of happiness on my tongue. The sunset, peacock showing off its colors, quietly drowns deep my loneliness. It's summer. The season of nice weather, no school, long waited trip to grandma's house, in the small town with mountains all around. The first deep breath of mountain air fails to tame my drumming heart. I see the red roof, the orchard trees still tall and silent. As the aroma of the garden flowers make me dizzy for a moment, I hear her steps, small, steady taps. She, she calls my name. I'm in the prison, a prison of her warm embrace. The summers of my childhood, a refuge for all sorrows next to follow. So the first four poets that you've heard, this is their first time that they've been reading here, so. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hopefully, you will come back and read again for us. Um, so our next poet has been here um, since the beginning, and her name is Beverly. Thank you, Philip. He looked right at me, eye contact, and I said, okay. <laughs> he is definitely going to call me. All right, um, this is a great opportunity. I thank you all for coming here and, you know, just hearing my poetry and we all get together with no judgment. Okay, I have three, and it shouldn't take me very long to read them. Uh, you know, when I read to other people, I'm like, okay, work with me. It's about one minute per poem. Okay, um, this one's for... Believe again. I feel kind of down, a little bit depressed, but I am up and I will get dressed. Positive affirmation? Yes, I use them. Negative thoughts of things? I refuse them. I refuse to let anything get in my way. I will be pleasant and have a good day. See, I figured out a long time ago, if your atmosphere is bitter, you can't grow. You may not be able to grow right at this exact minute, but think of something fantastic and drown yourself in it. Fill your thoughts with happiness, soaked through and through. Think of a waterfall. How about a trip to the zoo? Anything, come on, you have to feel new. I can't express it or explain it any other way, but nothing, no nothing should be allowed to spoil your day. 
you are responsible for your actions and what you achieve, no matter if you start over. You still have to believe. You are a real winner, a genuine hero. Look at you now. You started at zero. So keep your head held high in all that you do. Have a well-adjusted attitude and always believe in you. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to read this one. Different times, I'm in a different space, and um, I'm going to read this one as well. This one is called, oh yeah, I wrote it August 26th of 2019. Okay, this one's called, Still in Control. The hands that once folded in prayer has a heart now that wonders. Does anyone care? The flowers that once grew in the garden have long withered and been discarded. The smile you saw as bright as the sun is now sorrow that can't be undone. Okay, wait, before any more sadness and gloom, just enter into a soft, bluish purple room, a room of peacefulness and so much knowledge. You'll believe you skipped grade school and went straight to college. So definitely make prayer your first choice. Speak loud and clear. Use your voice. The flowers are just a metaphor of all your dreams, and a smile is exactly what it seems. And there's no need to carry sadness around. Just look for some joy, then spread it around. See, life has circumstances, but you have to choose, because someone else would love to be in your shoes. So wake up each day with a new ambition. That's it. You will complete the mission. See, it's so simple but we make it so hard. Just hang on in there. Don't let down your guard. And that tiny spark you feel deep down in your soul is God telling you he's still in control. Okay. Um, thank you all so much once again. Now, a friend of mine was telling me something. So anyway, this is what I wrote, and it's called Smile. There must be something I can do if I am such a great poet, looking back over my life, it doesn't really show it. I won't bore you with details or talk about something lame because I am quite fortunate and I'm not worried about rain. I listen to people's life stories that got A's right from the start, saying if you stay focused, you won't fall apart. I've seen people fail in school every day of the week and now people are lined up for miles just to hear them speak. Now I didn't get bad grades, and I don't really like large crowds, but I can speak in a soft voice, and the, mes and the message is still quite loud. This is not about me or making good grades. It's about not dwelling on the mistakes that you have made. You are your best supporter, so go ahead and give yourself a hand. And yes, there is a reason God placed you on this land. You may have anxiety, depression, every illness from A to Z, but you can be the best you that you can be. So admire yourself once in a while. Begin and end each day with a great big smile. Thank you guys, you guys are great. Thank you, Beverly. You're <laughs> Again. Applause for the poem and the poet. So our next poet um, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, she's one of the most respected poets in the South Shore community. We go back 20 years and we grew up together in, um, in the community of poetry. Um, please welcome Linda Thayer. Thank you. Um, I taught science in the Boston Public Schools for 34 years. I retired 15 years ago. And um, we recently had a retired teacher's luncheon, so we were all reminiscing. So I thought I'd read this poem called Currency. It's kind of about missing teaching, but. Having spent my youth, my stamina, my strength, trying to push back the frontiers of unknowing and lovelessness, hoping to plant seeds of understanding and harmony, I am spent. Some say it's heaven to retire, and though I am at peace to break bread with those as spent as I, 
and feel close to content to spin stories hours on end with those who are my veteran friends. Sometimes, when the voices fall silent, a secret piece of me longs to invest somehow, earn a little currency, and spend myself again. I miss it. <laughs> One of the hardest things that I ever heard from someone about teaching is that teachers have a part-time job. That's probably the worst thing you can ever, ever say to a teacher. Uh, one day it crystallized for me why people teach. I taught earth science and I was teaching a lesson one day about how to locate the epicenter of an earthquake. You need three readings, you draw three circles and where they intersect, that's, that's where the earthquake is. So this is called the earthquake and it explains my love for teaching. The earthquake. The student stared at the page. Three wavy lines that bear a secret, a mystery to be revealed, the fingerprints of a shaken world. Three calculations, three cities, three circles, an epicenter, a point in time. The student stared at the paper, then looked into space, rechecked the page, turned to me and said, that is so cool. <laughs> Some say teaching is about short hours, summers off, July and August. That's tragic. It hasn't been any of these. It's about seeing the earth move in the eyes of a child in a priceless moment of magic. And, and one last thought. Um, I used to like to teach astronomy, but if you ever begin to study astronomy, very soon you get bogged down in chemistry, physics, and math. Um, I showed the kids a film and it was about these astronomers who were brilliant physicists and mathematicians, but every once in a while, they had to go out at night, spread a blanket, and just look up. So this poem is kind of like that. There's a little bit of technical jargon, but it's necessary to the point of the poem, so I apologize for being technical. But this is called astronomy. You never learn anything half so well as when you have to teach it to somebody else, but astronomy. Copernicus, Newton, Einstein, Hubble, Heliocentric gravitational relativities and red shifts. Red shifts, astronomical infinitesimal, infinitesimal singularity and big bang. Big bang? Primordial nucleosynthesis and endless expansion? Or critical density oscillation and blue shifts, omega naught of one, quirks of quarks in and out of nothing across the starry sky? Each question answered poses pursuers more questions, an exponential expansion of our unknowing in the splendid chase of the mind. But sometimes I simply prefer to stand before the night in silence and breathe the eloquence of God. And as you heard, that's why she's one of the most respected poets in our community. <clears throat> Please welcome to the open mic, Ann Doyle. Thank you. I'm going to read a poem called Praying. Uh, Mother marched me off to Mass every Sunday morning. She was single-minded in her pursuit to make me holy. It didn't take. I studied stained glass windows, checked out church ladies' hats, hair, shirtwaist dresses, and then I would pretend I owned the church and decide to put my chef's kitchen in the front, use the altar as a workstation. My room would be up on the balcony with a canopy bed for, in my office space in the sacristy. When Mother peeked at me, I put my fake praying face on and studied pastel saints painted on the ceiling. I bowed my head, I folded my hands, I read about miracles, but I couldn't conjure up this being called God. I pleaded for a sign, sent messages to saints and angels, but there was no reply. I knelt in church, I thought about Jesus and his parents and all the saints and martyrs but the jelly donut waiting in the pantry was heavy on my mind. 
And to be perfectly honest, the idea of two men plus a ghost in one body scared the crap out of me. When I learned there were thousands of gods, I tried a few others. I prayed to Wahyahi, the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I prayed to Angus, the god of love and poetic inspiration. I prayed to Apollo and Ceres, the god of opportunity, luck, and favorable moments. Still, no answers. That's not to say I don't pray today. I pray to the stark loneliness of brown tree branches reaching up to touch a white winter sky. I pray to birds, chubby babies, and senile ladies. I pray to the fierce love of silver-haired grandmothers and golden dogs with fat brown eyes. Sometimes I pray for supermarket eggnog or for a long train trip with a window seat and a glass of good red wine. Listening to lazy, bluesy jazz is my favorite kind of prayer. This one's called um, The Man Who Lives Downstairs. He sits beside his pile of dusty dreams, losing lottery tickets and lousy ideas in a musty, airless room. Suicidal strips of crispy wallpaper curl up and then float to the floor. They cause crunchy sounds under the old man's slippers. Wife number two called herself Crystal and danced for dollar bills in a dirty downtown dive. She said the thinness of his lips was a certain sign of stinginess, but her eyes were always larger than his wallet. She swore he had no blood because his veins were fill full of venom. She left him for a circus clown who thought he was an astronaut. She lunches on regret, ceaseless sorrow, and long, sad cigarettes. Under the big brass bed in a room he never enters lies an old duffel bag bulging with bad decisions and broken promises. Sometimes in the dead of night the bag twitches and hazy hairbrand hair schemes hold hands with long dead relatives and creep across the room to shake and startle the old man who swallows a soundless scream. He has two children, born to wife number one, whose middle name was Alice. He keeps a cup of sarcasm next to his telephone, just in case they call. He dines on carbohydrates with several long, loose teeth. A stomach full of acid keeps him from lying flat. And so he sits up all night long in his lazy boy recliner. Millie, who lives across the hall, thinks he needs a hug. But she can never get her skinny arms around his heavy coat of anger. Convinced that she can fix him, she finds his rudeness charming. She brings him heaping plates of food and bright, hopeful smiles and tiny nips of whiskey. The old man sneers at her and gobbles up her dinners. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Anne. Again, applause for the poet, applause for the poem. Our next open mic person is Otter Jorge Travaris. I don't have anything to say. I have an impromptu reading. Nope. No. Oh, okay. So we do have a treat for you today. Um, the next poet is going to be our feature in January. So you're going to get a little taste of his poetry, and hopefully you'll come back in January and hear the full set. Please welcome Mr. Jason Wright. I'm having a day. Let you know that. It's either a good day or a bad It's pretty much a bad I'll say it's a bad day. I'm having a bad day. That's why I came here today, because it just so happened it fell on this day that I'm having a bad day. So. I'm glad I'm here to talk to you about my bad day in front of the camera. <laughs> so, um, my name is Jason Wright, and um, I write a poetry and art magazine called Oddball Magazine. I'm wearing the hat and the t-shirt. 
Because after a while, you just start to dress yourself with your own clothes. And, and I, it's just something you do. You, you buy the Nike Swish sign or you make the Nike Swish sign. And I make the Nike Swish sign, so don't sue me, Nike. Um, I wrote a book a long time ago called A Letter to the World in 2015. And I'm going to read a poem, the poem from A Letter to the World. I'm going to read a poem called Ray Gun recently from my phone because, you know, let, everyone loves when poets do that, right? It's like the worst thing ever. And then I'm going to read something from my notebook, which I haven't published yet. So uh, I will start with the thing I haven't published yet. Um, it's called State of Recovery. And um, I go to, I, I'm a peer support specialist, and um, I lead a peer support group. And we were talking about the idea of recovery. Um, and a lot of people think it's about like, you know, having substance abuse issues, but it's really not. It's about this whole life. If you've been where you, if you were born, you've been through some shit and now you are in recovery from it. And that's kind of what this, this poem's about. It's called, it's called State of Recovery and it has multiple swears. So here we go. <clears throat> All this shit, recovery, the media, the stigma, recovery, the abuse from schools, recovery, the school shootings, the bruises, the wins, the losers, recovery. The poverty didn't choose me. The world of boosters didn't soothe me. Society abuses me. Doesn't need to be all this shit, recovery. The trauma, the forensic sentences, the dead residents, this world of wellness, the chemo treatments, the surge of needles, the world of club drugs, psych ward shrugs, job applications, train stations, no space stations. This shit encompassed the drink, the shuffle, the world of troubled thoughts and prescription spots, the fucked up language around it, the stigma surrounding it, all in a vacuum, that recovery in a nutshell. I'm recovery. No casserole dishes, no flowers. So this poem is Jagged Thought 294 off of my magazine that I publish every Tuesday along with multiple other poets. So if you are a poet, come to my magazine and uh, send me your stuff. There's been some really great poets here. Um, Beverly, thank you so much. You really like lifted me a little bit. So uh, Jagged Thought 294, Ray Gun. I am one rosy ray of sunshine. I have a ray gun in my hand to feel sublime. The writer in me stands for the dramatics. And the other in me writes for the manics. And another part of me writes for the parents. And another part of me writes for the pregnant. And another part of me writes for the idealist. And another part of me writes for the concealist. And another part of me writes for the realist. And another part of me writes all my secrets. And another part of me writes for the beauties. And another part of me writes for the behemoths. And another part of me writes for the fanatic. And another part of me writes for the bullied. And another part of me writes for the worn. And another part of me writes for the movies. And another part of me writes for the school shooters. And another part of me writes for the drug abusers. And another part of me writes for this trigger finger. And another part of me writes for the choir singer. And another part of me writes for the drama queen. And another part of me writes for the played out scene. And another part of me writes for the depressed. And another part of me writes for the obsessed. And another part of me writes for the babies wondering where it all went and who's going to save me. And another part of me writes for the mistakes. And another part of me writes for the woke who attend the wakes. And another part of me thinks he is better. And another part of me thinks he is far worse. And another part of me holds a wallet. And another part of me holds a purse. And another part of me holds a key to a tenement where the rent is paid and the gold is heaven sent. And another part of me holds a two bedroom. And another part of me loses footing and another part of me sings for the sullen, and another part of me sings for the forgotten, and another wants you to love me, and another part wants you to free me, and another part of me wants me to fall in, and another part of me wants me to trust the process, knowing this life is nonsense, that all this pointless rhythm and reason is garbage and no one will ever stand your problems. Everything good might go away as usual, the casual life is brutal, the sing-song world is full of kinks and destroyers and Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan, Joan Baez and Berman Missions. And you are just an aging musician who never had a crowd that cared.
who never had a band to play with, and no one who really ever listened. Thank you. Can I read um, and the last, the la I have this book for sale if you'd like to, um, to, to buy it for money. Um, come and talk to me. It's called, a, uh, it's called A Letter to the World, and, and a brief, brief story about this book was when I was uh, in high school, there was this girl, her name was Amanda, and she was a wonderful, wonderful girl, and she had uh, a vision in life to make things better. She, she started this charity called High Five for Charity in Mansfield a million years ago. And after I got sick, um, as I got older and I got sick and started dealing with mental health shit and everything, I saw her one time and she ended up passing away. So she passed away from this, this illness that is like, it doesn't matter what she passed away from. It was some degenerative thing, you know? So um, I wrote a, this poem to her, and it's called A Letter to the World. And it's dedicated to Amanda Wilding, and, and it's in this book. I want to write a letter to the world that never wrote to me. <clears throat> I do it best through poetry, mimicking sweaty rhymes and motion sickness. A poet standing tall, speaking wisdom. Maybe not knowing the world as you may see it. Severed synapses keep me constantly thinking. I wonder what I should write about to tell you where I stand, to tell you where I think I belong. I belong in the chorus of a song. I once belonged in wards sheltering my storm. I once wandered highway roads to find my solace sinking, rising with the sun because I couldn't bear sleeping, collapsing in a park with two strangers standing by me, sleeping for a century but only really seconds, wandering the willows to find my shelter with Connor O'Burr singing songs to me and wearing my father's sweater. He was sick at the time. It reminded me of him. I never knew I would persuade him to pick up writing. I kept tuned to my dream as far as I could see it. Once I wanted to be a millionaire and never stopped dreaming. I thought my silence was golden, but I was only bronze. Couldn't stop talking. Didn't know who I was. Met a friend who has been with me through poetry and music. Lost a couple friends to death and overdose. One high school friend I missed the most. She told me she was sick once after school, that she had a disease that would take her. It took her at 27. I saw the greatest minds of my generation stolen from me, and I saw it under my eyes, and gravity outweighed me, but I keep survival on my mental like a rash of poison ivy. And I understand I will die one day, and I hope you never cry for me. But while I'm here, I write with passion for people who have passed and people who believe that there is really something that I don't understand, but I never get sick of fighting, realizing that I write with fire, ocean, and lightning, and where I am, I never really see it. I'm a poet, and with speech, I have my freedom. I didn't mean to dedicate this to an angel's passing, but Amanda wrote and was dedicated to making things happen with passion. Even in high school, she was my oddball companion, and we worked on the cover. It was three astronauts, me, her, and Nick V on our own oddball planet. Because back then I was sad and had only poetry to prove it. My family called it quits and moved to separate addresses. I kept on with poetry, music, the motion, and movement. Because I can write and some cannot, and that's why anger exists. That's why slit wrists and broken fists exist. That is what I realized, that writing poetry was my sanctuary and has kept me alive. And now I write and I write still listening to music. An ocean of love I try to create and keep my dreams breathing. Because you never know when it's your time to go. And when you can't see the ocean, then therein lies the end. When the tidal waves come, and believe me it does in every dream I've always had. Remember me for poetry, friends. That's all I am. <clears throat> um, so I'll be, I'll be here next month um, doing a, a full feature, so please come and check it out. Thanks. January. What's December will happen to? January. Um, oddballmagazine.com. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Again, applause for the poet. Applause for the poem. And we will see Jason in January for a full feature. So I am very fortunate. Um, I live like five minutes from here, and if I get in my car, I'm here in like two minutes. So how many drove here today? Everybody? Yep, we got a lot of people. So our next feature, right, this just goes to show you the power of poetry, the power of communication, of wanting to communicate. Rode his bike 
from Sharon. Please welcome Ed Abrahamson. Thank you, Philip. Thank you to this wonderful Brockton venue, which makes our expression of emotion and perhaps historical uh, memory possible. History is a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. How many Americans remember that America's first female president of the United States was Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> After the great World War I, President Wilson was disappointed that the League of Nations had not been approved by the United States despite its uh, approval by most all other nations. He became very ill and uh, his wife just took over the White House and for many months and, uh, until he died, she was actually acting president of the United States. Well, I have a bunch of sonnets that are called unsutured sonnets, and these are mostly nonfiction snapshot snapshots from the 20th century. In, in Vietnam, the, the pilots that gave close air support to the troops, to American troops on the ground, had a standing order that they could not land amongst the troops if they were in contact with the enemy. Here's, here is one exception, and this sonnet is for Hugh Thompson, landing, 1968. Two bristling gunships circled high and slow, ears cocked for calls from hardened hearts gone cold, and what they witnessed pulled their pilots low to haunt the burdened decades that unrolled. But you had standing orders not to land. Cuts no ice to soothe a savage soul. Stood tall for valor, lieu of reprimand. Court-martial cannot suit the hero's role. Saw G.I.'s minced by remote-triggered mine. Waste elders, children, widows on the road. Red spattered black at green rice paddy shrine. They landed, countered orders broke the code, trained their guns to halt the do and die, take the medal, hush, no reasons why. Hugh Thompson kind of disappeared from the scene. I'm sp that last sonnet was about the My Lai Massacre, of course, 
where American troops massacred just civilians in Vietnam. And uh, he reported it after he took his action to stop them from shooting them. He reported it to his chain of command. They told him to shut up, take this medal, and a few months later they transferred him out of the unit. The next sonnet is from an experience I had when I traveled. I was traveling around the world on business and I stopped at Calcutta one weekend and it's called Paddling 1972. On midnight streets oppressed by weight of heat Straw mats don't block a pavement's glow. Hear murmured sounds of families row on row against Calcutta's station's steaming heat beat. And those who pass that night beyond deceit are carted over cobbles head to toe with cabs and cows and streetcars overflow, cross boulevards, Victorian conceit, while limbless lepers paddle for their prize, a coin of pity wrested from a crowd that's charmed around a mongoose and a snake. Can writhing torsos close to earth arise from cast on skateboard level if allowed? Too bad about your gift of life's mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> Again. Applause for the poet, applause for the poem, and a special applause for how we got here, riding his bike from Sharon Bass. So I am the last person on the open mic. I will be doing uh, two poems. Um, the United Nations has designated November 25th, International Day for the Elimination of violence against women. These two poems I'm about to read are conversations that I had with um, two of my friends many years ago. Um, and that inspired these poems. Unfortunately, they are still relevant today. The first poem is called Skin Against Skin. Stood in back, listening to words that made no sense. Suit and tie, Sunday best, hole in sock, nicotine fit. Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. It's been since my last confession. Was he closer to God? He felt it. It felt good. Skin against skin. Can't you do anything right? You should be thankful I'm even with you. Do you really think anyone is going to believe you? She didn't feel it. Not anymore. Lost count between one and infinity. Skin compressed against skin. Do you, I, love, cherish, honor, obey, obey, obey till death? Skin shatters, skin trust ruptured. He cried, I love you, I love you, I love you. His tears, his rage, unrelenting, his possession. 
I love you. She didn't cry. Broken record, no tears, no anger, unresisting, no her, scratched, worn out, worn out. I love you. His life, her life, one life, his life, his sleep. In a moment of serenity, she thinks of the Sistine Chapel. God gives life to Adam. God damn him. Hand sinks into her side. She feels for one rib, at least one, that's not been broken. Tries to give it back. And the choir sings, Alleluia. Head bowed in silent prayer. About last night, too much beer, lungs burn from the smoke. Oh God, I'm coming. God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, was he closer to heaven? Don't. Push me. Why are you making me do this? Don't you care about me? When are you going to learn? If a man hits a woman and she falls and there's no one around to hear, does she make a... This next poem is called Catch-22. The day lost, she stood in the middle of the antiseptic aisle, seeing her reflection in the aluminum can of 46-ounce fruit juice. At that moment, wished for an out-of-body experience. Was it all in vain? Substance of her being, shell of her innocence cracked, tears that pooled beneath, emotions of her essence from quicksand slowly pulling, slowly fading, life. She wanted to scream, needed to laugh, craved the silence, desired this all for herself. Eyes, gaze, familiar quiet, soul tattered, concealing broken windows, hum of her existence blends mediocrity, everyday routine. Eat, subsist, authoritative, invalidate. Less is more, give and take. Every time, tear down, and justify the means. I mean, how much more can you take? Veins cut points, penetrate deeper. Join, then return, blood to heart. Mouthed intention under breath. I'm tough, got nails through my palms. I have sinned and forgiven retrospect of love, exquisite process of denial. If things were different, she could have been a, and her muse aches. Time of day was lost. She stood in the middle of her, sought the child within. Fingers lock, eyes meet, reflections collide. She wanted the child, desired the woman. Was it all in vain? Propped up pretty blue, centered in porcelain skin. Naked tears wash away implausible hopes. Shadows lay waste to the sound of the rain felt every day. Eyes indefinable. What if she missed? Off by a hair? The risk. She wanted to scream. Needed to laugh. Craved the silence, herself, for all this desired. So we have one more person on the open mic, and I'm going to take a vote. Do we take like a five, 10 minute break?
or do we go straight through to our features? Break. Break. Okay. Please welcome Trish. Hi, everyone. Um, this one's an older one. Um, I'm on this journey right now of um, finding myself and um, getting over some things in my past. So this one's titled, Who Am I to You? And I wrote it in 1996. A stranger in a foreign land, no one listens or understands. I need comfort, a loving touch. So far from me, but I need it so much. The song plays the same sad song. I grow weary. I'm not sure of how long I can hold on. You promised me love, and it was only conditional. I'm grown and feeling lost, over emotional. I'm a nine-year-old inside with lost hopes and dreams. I know I'm losing myself, falling apart at the seams. God, can you take me in my sleep? I'm dying a little more each day. Commandments are harder to keep. Years quickly progressed, and I'm feeling alone and depressed. A teen without boundaries, virtue quickly taken. A child at 18? No, we must be mistaken. Do I continue my path? Why have I lost my purpose and have no goal? I have completely no protection on the earth, can't save my soul. Do I hear the voice of God anymore? Once he was quite loud, now a dull roar. I raised my son as a single mom, made it okay, this was my norm. I had another child, a baby girl, thought she was my life. The life now with physical abuse was beyond the bruises, I had strife. I'm raising two kids on my own, but I came to find that I wasn't alone. God had me and has been my solid foundation. A relationship with him has my feet planted. I am a new creation. I'm leaning on him and life has been sweeter. Went to church and became a greeter. The wonderful mercy and grace is fully abound. Jesus, my savior, life is better with him, a sheep once lost and now found. <sighs> this one's titled, Finding Me. I discovered there's a lot to learn when it comes to finding me. I have many battle wounds. Each one holds a piece of history of a woman broken, both physical and mental, with enough courage to withstand adversity. There's a lot I kept hidden. Many would be shocked to find such a person as me. If you search the planet, you may never find a victim of chaos, yet staying so refined. See, that I refuse to let the past define a woman of my stature and unique design. People can't appreciate the gifts I've been given. I will no longer compete with those who diminish this life I've been given. There's a reason for all things that happen in our life. It's usually for the good. There's lessons we learn that have us question the validity, or is it just misunderstood? It's beauty for ashes. The means to get there will have you guessing. Is it all worth it, these little life lessons? Do I let expectations that no one can meet keep me in bondage and away from God's best? Life is full of trials, obstacles, hardships, hangups, and tests. There are some egos that refuse to accept who I am, so I've been rejected, pushed aside, under the rug I was swept. People who are jealous of you can't appreciate the gifts you've been given. I won't compete with people who try to diminish the best life that I've been given. Be a woman of integrity. Let my decisions be clear. Realize I'm better than I was and what they told me. Well, took well over 30 years. On this earth where your very soul could be swallowed up whole, I've been sitting here fighting the masses and lost total control. I can't be true to myself when I look to another. No man is worth the loss of salvation of God to a lover. When I keep unrealistic expectations, they're meant to fail. It's not a place of comparison to others or even a sliding scale. People are who they are. 
No amount of praying will ever make them change. The ideas I had of who you were weren't clear but strange. Walking a path that excludes God will never work for my benefit. We need someone greater than ourselves to push through the mire and grit. The world offers confusion and manipulation. There's only a dead end with our current situation. We must seek sanctuary, yet we turn a blind eye to humanity. There's a greater purpose on earth. Time to put words into action. Then we will be fulfilled and get a full sense of satisfaction. I'm finding me and I'm not where I was, but I'm glad that I'm not where I used to be. Right now in this moment is all right with me. This one's titled, This Life, No Love. This life has its struggles. Sin has me imprisoned in walls that I can't break through. I wish I could figure it out, but it's not easy when it comes to you. I screwed up so many times, fallen flat on my face, but God never gave up on me or failed to show his amazing grace. Doing things my way depletes my energy. Judgment's cloudy, can't see straight. The burdens and cares of the world I carry on my neck, such a heavy weight. Weakened body, rejection, no solace or peace, the trauma is in my way. Can I do what I needed to do to change the course of my day? Loneliness is a silent killer. You walk around with a painted smile. It's only good for so long, you can't fake it after a while. This love, this need for love makes me crazy. I want so desperately for it to make sense. It's a constant battle in my mind to make smart choices, but mine are only dense. Once again, I heard myself saying, I'm giving my virtue to him today. We're living in these four walls, breaking each other's hearts. The painful truth is it ends long before it starts. I see the false sense of love. It feels like a heart attack. The piece of me I gave away has died and I'll never get it back. Now I walk with the shawl of shame draped over my shoulder. I'm bound in chains of sin that get heavier as I grow older. The times I should be smiling were the times I cried the most. There's nothing inside you to give an empty well, a distant memory, a ghost. Did you ever look into my eyes with pure devotion? It's like you've lost the ability to show true emotion. I've cried oceans of tears. I thought I needed a man to ease my fears. Someone who commit to my life, not brief moments, but years. I will never find love in this life until I love me. Almost 38 years of self-loathing is definitely not easy. Can this empty vessel be filled again? Self-love, self-care, and dedication. Tap into the spiritually uplifting tools, meditation versus medication. I've lost myself in an emotionally unept man. What will I gain? Tell me, what will I gain? Nothing, just scattered pieces of me to gather, find strength to begin healing from this pain. I look at myself now as if it was for the first time. This journey gave me lessons and learning from them will be sublime. I finally see that I must put my needs first and I can't give out of my lack. Make up for this grave injustice to myself and feelings start to pick up the slack. Sloppy love, undermining my value, caused stress to my inner being. I'm better than what I've been told and I best start believing. The masterpiece is still being constructed and prepared. Get amongst people who have stories and life breathing wisdom to be shared. Dreams once lost can become a reality even if it's just one. You and you alone, no one else, can write the future and let the past be done. I'm doing what I can now for myself and no more complacent living, getting dusty on a shelf. Believe that I am a miracle, part of God's design. There's no one else in this world like me. I'm a unique one of a kind. I'm not just a drained soul meant to be alone. I'm making great strides with poetry and making myself known. Thank you.
And that's what you call poetic intervention. I think Trish following me um, was quite something. Um, so we're going to take a quick five minute, 10 minute break. There's some refreshments outside. The most important thing, everybody come back. And if a voice inspired you, please go up to them and talk to them and validate their words. OK? This is what this is all about. So we'll see you in five minutes. Welcome back. Here we go. We have our features. Um, can we have another round of applause for our open micers? People who did the open mic. So I am very excited. We have um, a student from Brockton High. Um, one of the things this series does is that we invite student poets to feature along with the uh, established poet. And we are very um, happy to have Nyla Bedgood, who's a senior at Brockton High. And she has been writing ever since the eighth grade. But was all, it was always for fun and never serious. She posted on Wattpad and people ate it up. When she went back to her account a couple years ago, she deleted everything because she thought it was But once she really dug into her creative writing class, she had to change the way she wrote. She had excelled faster because mentally, she was behind on the writing spectrum. And that class changed her entire future. She's planning on being a creative writing major and her current poetry and world literature, liter or teacher is pushing her farther than she ever thought she could go. She can't move you in, she can't move you with a lengthy piece of, a piece of music and can't draw a picture with big meaning. But she hopes one day to write a book that shakes the earth. <laughs> Please welcome Nyla Bedgood. My hair always looks like a unicorn threw up on it, but <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I'm gonna start. This one doesn't really have a name per se, but I wrote it for class and I really liked it. And it's completely not about someone in this room. Um, <laughs> here we go. Also, by the way, like when I do this, I um, my writer's name is Halen Ray. It's Nyla backwards, and then I just really like the name Ray. It went through a lot of trial and error. It started as Halen Ray Taiga, and then it started as Ray Taiga, and then I just scratched Taiga and just went from Halen Ray. You know, keep it, keep it chill, keep it roll off the tongue. <laughs> I'm really anxious. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna get to the poem. Um, again, it doesn't have any name. <laughs> Hot summer spent on fake grass, marching drill until the sun hit the tip of the stands, day after day until the brass melted into his hands, becoming a part of him. Summer sets, school bells blare, he roams the long prison-like halls unaware. He spits out yellow-bellied insecurities with big-bellied laugh and, and shies away from photographs. He looks up to me even though I look up to him, even though he looks down on me. Every day we practice with our trombones. Every day we sit in the dark with our headphones, listening to music that makes us sad so we can feel something. 
He's always stumped with things to do, people to see, relaxing isn't a word in his parents' dictionaries. He's under a lot of thumbs, hair fading gray rapidly. He doesn't do much of anything happily. When we're together, our, laughs, ec our laughter echoes through the room. His smile stretches a mile wide while my face crinkles like a rugged strip on the roadside. On bus rides home from unimpressing football games, I sleep in his lap. He's warm and calm. The bus rides are typically cold and long. With every pull, the bus has an internal earthquake. He's a night owl soaring through the cities, never letting anyone give him pity. Hi, Andrew. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> this one also doesn't have a name. I have trouble with naming things. If I had a child, it would be a blank space. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, in my notes, it's written as blah. So, yeah, this one's a little bit um, darker. You're gonna see it's gonna get really pitch black down here. Um, but yeah, please rip her eyes out of their sockets before they melt like wax. Please rip her tongue from her mouth before she spits out desperate sentences. Please rip her heart out from her rib cage so she doesn't start letting it beat again. I'm sorry for this abrupt message, but you've got to give me some le leverage. I don't know why I'm apologizing. I was delusionally romanticizing almost every conversation we had. And since you failed to wake me from the delusion, then I guess I have the right to be mad. I guess I have the right to be upset and at the occlusion. I can't even tell what this feeling is. My heart is beating awkwardly and drops every third beat and falls through my rib cage, just like how you fell through my fingers like sand on the beach. My heart found its way around my intestines and onto my stomach, pressing and pushing it down onto my, la into my bladder. I can't help to feel queasy, uneasy. You're sleazy. No, you're not. I'm running out of rhymes. I'm running out of hours in these horrid days. Why can't joy be the only emotion that stays? Please set this poem in place. Don't, I'm running out of rhymes. You bow your head to say amen while I sit in wonder before I am forced to pick up my pen. No one is forcing to me to write this, to write anything. <laughs> this one has a name, shocker. Two out of three. <laughs> um, it's called The Day After January 8th, and it's very dramatic, like over, you know, oh, oh, it's just me. <laughs> so, yeah. It gets pretty fast, so I'm probably going to stutter, but it's fine. Sorry, I do this talking thing where I don't stop talking until someone says to, for me to stop talking. <laughs> All right. So, the day after January 8th. 24 hours after January 8th, 2002, my mother was in labor in a cold hospital room. She was stressed because I was stressed because I didn't want to be subjugation, subjected to all the subjugation. I didn't want to leave my perfect home. I ate peaches every day and binge sitcoms and a comfy recliner. Instead of leaving me be, the midwives cut open my poor mother and ripped me from my hiding place, which was fun. <laughs> Now I've sadly developed my own room, womb that kills me every month slowly. Thanks, God. The only womb I can hide inside is my own room, but I get ripped from there too. In the wild, I'm quiet. I remain to myself until approached or provoked. I have a little bass in my projective voice, often told to shut up in movie theaters, often cower in fear before someone wires my mouth shut. But hey, I give good hugs. My fat is fluffy and warm, and when I squeeze you, I almost don't want to let go of this warmth. Maybe it reminds me of my old hiding place. But those hugs are reserved for people who are special to me. I don't like my voice. It's too low to belong to a girl and too high to belong to a guy. It's too raspy and awkward to be confident, but too confident to be raspy and awkward. It's too sarcastic to be taken serious and, be, and too serious to be taken sarcastically. Sarcastically. I'm taller than most, I'm shorter than most. I don't need glasses to see, but I need something to cover my eyes at all times, something to show me a clearer life, other than this blurry one where I can't see past my fingertips. 
I walk like a zombie down the streets and through the halls. I walk fast to get to my destination. I don't want to be subjected to this damnation. The longer I'm walking, the more narration from the peanut gallery. If I don't walk quickly to escape, I'll be trampled on like Mufasa. I'll collapse under the weight of everyone else's actions. I love fall weather. It's perfect temperature, the falling orangey leaves mixed with the remnants of a summer breeze. I wish I could hold, I wish it could last forever. The day before January 10th, I go to another step. But I, I don't know where I'm stepping, but I know I am. I'm not a God-fearing man, but I fear my life will never be acceptable to society's eyes. I don't know why I need that reassurance, but I don't know why I'm being punished for my mother's actions. I can't figure out, out how to get out of this poverty. I'm not living on the streets, but I also can't afford groceries every week. I'm comfortably uncomfortable, whether it's my own body or the invisible cash in my wallet that dictates my worth. I'm a circle trying to fit into the square that is life, the same life, and fluctuates and bends in all the wrong ways. I never fit in anywhere where I go. Whether it's the color of my skin, the way I dress, how I talk, my sense of humor. I have two names. When you mirror one, you get the other. No, those names don't equal the same person. They equal the same body. With two sides of the brain fighting over which one gets to take the reins, I have two names. When you mirror one, you get the other. No, those names don't equal the same person. They are the same body. The body that they fight over like hyenas fighting over a weak old carcass. I look inside me to find who I am, but all I find is useless organs and a heart beating without a purpose. I look outside to find who I am, but all I see is colorful hair in front of a pudgy face. All right, this next one is um, about all of the um, mainly, there's been a lot of like sex trafficking going around like here and like there's been a lot of like people like going missing and like reappearing later and stuff. So this one is um, based off of my anxiety of when I just walk home from the bus stop and then I'm just gone. So, <clears throat> There are characters, and this one sort of has a name. It's called Bad Ideas. So, yeah. Okay. Hey, come over. Ronnie typed into her phone. The message bounced from her phone to the satellite to Megan's phone. Sure, can I get a ride? Megan sent eagerly, waiting for a reply. Her stomach drops when she reads, Sorry, Meg, my mom has the car. Ronnie sent another text. It's not a long walk, plus it's a nice day. Megan hesitantly typed. Yeah, all right, see you soon then. Before Megan could lock her phone, Ronnie sent, okay, okay, I'll clean up a bit. It's a sunny fall day. Leaves trickling down off thin branches, one foot out her house, a second foot in the grave. The color of, the, of her skin was already a target. Color of her skin, strike one. The texture of her hair, strike two. What will be strike three? Will it be the way she walks? Her curves are gawked at like a prize to be won. Will it be the way she's dressed? Her clothes morphed on, her clothes morphed on with degrading terms. What will be strike three? When she walks down the street, whose attention will she grab unintentionally? She steps off of base. Anyone can tag her now. If she's not fast enough, this simple game of tag will turn into a manhunt. On the main road, cars speed past her. Anytime there's a slow car, she motions away from the road, out of reach, dodging the hands of attackers. She's too far to run back, sweat oozing from her pores, freezing and sticking to her face. Her heart is running while her legs are paced, standing up tall, shoulders back. If she looks ghetto, she will be tagged. She tries to blend in and look natural, but the color of her skin is far too vibrant. She sees her friend's house, almost at the next base. One more street to cross, a few more steps to take. Two strikes, one more and she's out. Any slower, she'll be tagged. Into the house she goes, dripping in sweat, smelling like fear. She's safer now, as long as she stays on base. Okay, so. 
drink away my anxiety. Hi. <laughs> so this one doesn't have a name. It was also for class. Um, it's very fast. If you get the references, you, you, you get them. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Off centered in the rib cage is the heart. Its confident motions show it's a bit of a flirt. Underneath the motions, the word naive is blatantly visible. Every time it's screwed over, the beat slows down into critical. But this was different, or maybe it was desperate. I'm getting tongue tied on the story, even though there's almost no story to tell. Everything's orderly out of order, awkward and perfectly in keeping with life. Like a glass of water, one drop away of overflowing. Relax, count it out. Don't, take this, don't shake the table or else it will spill. Four. No, wait. Yeah, four. Water dripping into the cup with small drops. Months go by without batting an eye. The heart races. Seven. No, I think it's one. It's seven. Water gushed into the cup, rushing. The bubbling emotions can't be suppressed any longer, leaving it, leaving the heart faceless. One. Yes, no, no, it's four. We already did four. I, I, yeah, it's one. The glass was completely empty. Not even dust resides in it. Band camp was up and running, first year in charge, with, with about 10 confused freshmen. Nine, it's five. It's nine, yep, that, that, one, two, three, nine, ten, yeah. The clear liquid relaxes on the rim. He said he could pretend it never happened. There was a weird, subtle tension. 3.14156593, what? A couple more drops. School bells chimed through the heart and through its body. Eight. It can't be eight, it's eight. I already ate. Pretty sure I did. <coughs> the glass is full, but there's more and more incoming drops. Its words face through him. He replied with a nonchalant at laugh. Five, three, eight, nine, seven, two, six, three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight nine five five five. Is this glass half empty or half full? It squeezed all of its energy to him for some odd reason. Two, finally getting somewhere. Two? Two. A single drop, round and cute. The friendship builds and builds and the heart sometimes flutters. Six, six, seven, six? It's swelling and rising faster, but it doesn't know why. Thoughts intrude its everyday life. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This, this is the first time it's been stung by a harmless bee, but the not the first time it's been stung. One drop, two lines, and the glass overflowed and secreted onto the table. It's wet. <laughs> All right, this is my last one. Yes, it is. This one's um, darker and a little hoary, so enjoy, because that's what I love. <laughs> this one also does not have a name, but like in my notes, I wrote it as the decomposition of my soul. You, you can kind of see where it's going. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine, I swear. I'm fine. I'm okay. Everything's fine. It's all great. It's, it's fine. Whew. Through the eyes of the dark ravens and curious crows, we can see a tragedy in the silent woods. Her eyes were rolled back into her head, her hands delicately hauled over the crisp brown leaves. She was so beautiful around the skybound trees, the squirrels tiptoed around her body, hoping the sleeping, sleeping giant wouldn't awaken. Because when her body fell, the woods shook. The blood oozing from her stomach reflected into the sky, leaving it stained with streaks of cotton candy tinted clouds. The trees with leaves remaining danced with the blood sky, continuing to be drained of their chloroplast before falling down with her. 
Falling to the ground and never arising again, her body didn't even flinch when the wind blew. Her clothes reeked of her fluids, but her sweet, entrancing perfume stood out from the decomposition of the crippling leaves around her. Insects kissed her skin, leaving marks and slight bumps along her neck, hands, and face. But the animals, friendly and not, tore her clothes in pieces of her skin. Her flesh was bare and started to rot. Around the throbbing red flesh was gooey, buttery infections. A dead body can't defend itself. To all who've come across it, it's fair game. I'm fine, I swear. I, I laugh. <laughs> I have a soul. <laughs> So one thing I can tell you today is that we will remember the name Nyla Good, Nyla Bedgood. 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 And I can't wait to invite her back as a feature. Feature. But on to our feature. So one of the things that we try to do here at Everyone Has a Voice is find new talent, new poets. Uh, this is going to be Lewis Fox's first feature anywhere. So we're really excited to hear his words. I met Lewis a few years ago and he found out I was a poet and kind of gave me a couple of his poems and I was mesmerized by his poetry. But he really never shared it with anybody, but slowly it came out. And today he's gonna to share it with all of you. So just a little bit about Lewis. He attended UMass Amherst, where he studied English and journalism. He will be forever grateful for the eclectic city that helped him create the person that he is today with a penchant for the surreal and a desire to understand unearth and unearth meaning from the mundane. Lewis has written as a hobby since he was a young man for cathartic release and as a means of warding off existential dread. I said the word. <laughs> Despite this, he takes life pretty carefully most of the time and hopes to one day take it serious or not nearly as serious as he does. You know, depending on the day. You will listen to Lewis read some of his poems and maybe bottle some, bottle some motivation with him. Even if we do this only for ourselves, it is worth every minute spent. Please welcome Lewis Fox. Don't worry, Nyla, I'm nervous as hell, too. <laughs> um, yeah. As Philip said, I've always written for myself, uh, so I appreciate Philip and Paul and the library for, I guess, uh, giving me an opportunity to chip away at, at the self-doubt that sometimes plagues our lives. Um, I've always liked writing and lyrics and everything where the individual who is digesting it can really take it and make it their own. But I'll still try to frame these and let you know kind of where my inspiration came from starting them, I guess. Um, so this first one was a night I was out and I ran into a whole bunch of people from high school that I did not want to talk to. Um, if they, it's called High School Reunion Bolarama, Kings on Fire. If they don't like the first sentence, they stop paying attention. Were they talking? yelling or swallowing secrets. The pyromaniac from your third grade class who is now a firefighter dances around like a court gesture throwing verbal firecrackers as you mentally cruise control the conversation. Instead, your focus and fingers on the bump of tissue you noticed in your midsection about two months ago as you hope they're both just a symptom of age and will go away. You wonder how you could believe that words don't validate us, but act like people could. In and out of adolescence, we should be past that. 
The kid who used to help you cheat in Spanish class recalls the time you made your pregnant teacher, who was also your neighbor, cry. Though he doesn't know you later brought her flowers and apologized, even though you didn't understand what you did wrong. Her, over there, maiden-like, she turns caterpillars into butterflies with her words, but they catch fire when she speaks. In and out of high school, kings no longer reign, but everyone reps royalty. Queens no longer fame, but everyone assumes loyalty. One down. <laughs> also, thank everyone for coming and listening. Um, if I'm trembling too much or I go too fast, shout at me and tell me to slow down. Um, this one is titled, It Doesn't Matter How You Get There. Um, and this is about a party that I did not want to be at. Um, <laughs> madness is less genetic and more of an environmentally triggered effect. He argued on the balcony while he sipped his Bud Light. I stopped listening because in my mind they both result in the same disconnect. This guy with his canary yellow sweater and matching indented bird-like jaw chirping incessantly about future madness. What about right now? I'm the kind of person who wants to land on the moon first, he said. What does that even mean? Anticipating the conversation's end with the feverish impatience of a dog awaiting its treat, I watched that midnight moon hang itself in boredom. As an eulogy, the tree's birds sung beautifully magnetic songs of murder and malice as they darted throughout the sky like delirious javelins looking for the hands that cast them into this cursed night. Uh, this next one is about uh, a friendship that breaks apart, I guess, even though you don't really know why, I guess. Uh, it's called Birds of Paradise. Vibrant and yellow-bellied, their blooming necks outstretch the vase like miniature giraffes plucking food from the hands of those who typically take their presence for granted. Their slanted, triangular heads cast shadows through the spider-webbed corner of my sky-blue wall, like pennants hung commemorating the remembrance of life's unfair circumstances. Afraid I'd devour and slowly kill the person I was glad you were, my mind, the flame to a Polaroid picture of a hopelessly vintage life. Every so often I still find myself peeking out the window, looking for your warming shadow amongst the siding of the neighbor's house. The two of us, feeling sorry for ourselves that we were ever cut for this world, vibrant but yellow-bellied. Water time. Mine just gets shaky, I don't know. You know. <laughs> All right, this is called Fossil Fuel. This is about my uncle. He was a good dude. Um, I knew a man in a wheelchair. When he wasn't in a wheelchair, he was in a bed. It was not a bed made of luxurious items like fine linens, good company, or even peaceful sleep. It was, however, a bed to be envious of built on resiliency, respect, relief. There was no way for me to understand those things at the time. Sometimes I ponder on my understanding of them today. Once I stole a Marlboro 100 from his neighbor and lit it up in his bathroom while everyone was outside waiting for the ice cream truck. After four or five suffocating puffs, I threw up in his toilet. He never scolded me for it, but he knew. The stench of smoke and vomit lingers long and deep. He understood humility more than most. Before he was in a bed and a chair, he was young. He used to run with a limp because one of his legs was shorter than the other. I don't know which, nor do I find it important. I can picture him now, refusing to slow down as he would round the corners, the grinding gears of his brace screaming for a greasing. I knew a man in a wheelchair. His words are carved into my chest. Scar tissue fossils of a dinosaur of a man from a time I had no way of knowing would linger so long and deep despite the sometimes unpleasant stench of life. All right. 
Uh, this is called Beer Trapped in the Bathroom. And this is uh, a time I was in the bathroom. Uh, not sober at all. Um, sometimes I stare at myself in the bathroom mirror. It's long, speckled with dirt and toothpaste splatter, and the golden hinges which hold it on are small and rusty. Today, as the sun bursts in from the window behind, I squint my eyes so their lashes blockade them, like cross-stitching one's own eyes. Little, jagged beams of sunlight break through to alter my figure and magnify my body's hair. I lay down, pretending to hibernate. The tub is my cave, the blue carpet's reflection in the blurred mirror, a lake. How difficult it must be, I think to myself, to catch a fish without a pole and bait. More importantly, if I were a bear, would I wonder what it feels like to be a man? I get down on all fours and slowly crawl towards the mirror. As I get closer, more sunlight seeps through my eyes, making my bearded face even more indistinct until my forehead bumps the cold glass. The water disperses and my eyes open fully and refocus. This must be what happens when a bear sees its own reflection in the water. It doesn't believe itself. My intense need for clarity exposing all of my anxiety as a worried face stares back, wondering what it was looking for. To begin with, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. For myself, I find exactly what I'm looking for, the need to feel human. All right. This one's about work, because sometimes work is terrible, right? Um, it's called Baby Steps. Fingertips like bruised oranges, dropping down on the keyboard like gavels declaring, this is most certainly a waste of your time. <laughs> Reminder, team meeting at two. Continued discussion of roles and responsibilities. Meeting rescheduled. There is an impromptu assembly being held in 4A. This is not a layoff. It is a reduction in workforce. As a result, the course on practical practices has been moved to Conference Room 101, but you need to be bonded first, and its attendees might argue it's really a course, a course in curbing creativity. Not even the sternest of shishi lions can protect us from this boredom. Next week, continued learning of roles and responsibilities, baby steps. <laughs> Um, this is about Christmas and how lying to kids is weird. Um, <laughs> imagination versus truth, how we pretend. Simmering in the disbelief of your loss, like when you were seven and found all your baby teeth stored away in an envelope in your parents' top bureau drawer, you said, I've lost the ability to dream. I pretended I was still sleeping. Later that night, on our pre-lit tree, we hung ornaments and you, yourself, for lying, as punishment for lying to kids. Santa doesn't get around by way of reindeer, I explained. I thought I told you, you screeched. It's the least we can do, I concluded. Without us, Santa doesn't exist. You pretended not to hear me through the shuffling of boxes and wrapping paper. All right. Um, this was a poem I wrote after I read a weird news article that was about people who got caught up in that Ashley Madison thing, which is like helping adults cheat on each other. Um, <laughs> two in Toronto, it's called God Sent Inspiration. Two in Toronto, two in Texas, inspiration by way of suicide. Get off the couch in open word because grief hangs heavier on the hearts of those who banged their way through boredom than those who've wasted their lives. Keep telling yourself that. Believe that with the nervous confidence of an adulterer. Your chance at this was left in the dusty corners of the classes you skipped. And besides, you care way less for things these days. Gray hairs sprout on your chest with the swiftness of a cheesy 80s movie montage, and they too long for romance. Frayed nerves turn the brisk rubbing of a wet spot found between your thighs, 
left on your box of briefs during a bathroom break into a full-blown panic attack, literally pissing dreams away. Who said irony was a dead scene? Self-doubt is the most sincere form of battery. Two in Toronto, two in Texas, suicide by way of inspiration. Uh, this one is called, I'm Working On It. My romance is a dusty can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup stored in the back row of our kitchen hutch. Still, it will nourish. My romance disintegrates like stitches buried deep in the raw, gummy gutters of dental patients. Still, it holds together. Some people use it. Some people lose it. Some people never had it. And some people abuse it. Sincerely, it is never not for want. That's about my terrible romance. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is just a poem I wrote on a random Valentine's Day. Um, it's called Pig Ears for Valentine's Day. From my window, I watched the neighbor's dog basking in the sun with his dark red chew toy and daydream about stealing him and driving away, our heads simultaneously swallowing the road. Sitting in the passenger seat, cloaked in confidence, you look at me as if I'm the sweetest cinnamon cyanide. I find some brief reverie in that, like when hope is unearthed from a fortune cookie so you can carry a little piece of it everywhere you go. I think to myself that Russell Stouffer must be a Freemason, though I'm not quite sure I want to be let in on the secret. If only we could freeze our daydreams, save tons of big blocks, and melt a phantasmal ocean to navigate. Or maybe they'd be better served stored, in, stored away in ice cube trays, tiny vessels of avoidance we could break out whenever we get itchy with evasiveness. They would buoy in our glasses, diluting the potency of current time. I'd chomp and slurp on them, guard them, trying my damnedest not to let anyone else get a piece like a dog with a pig's ear in its mouth. Here's another one about work. <laughs> uh, it's called Five O'Clock Shadow. Each day I march toward those revolving doors. My struggle inside casts a battlefield of shadows on the shiny gray marble steps that I have to tiptoe through. A security badge is not armor. There's a deconversion this week, so they're going to need people to work Saturday. We can't offer you overtime, but we'll let you go early during the week. And then there's the recognition. I said I couldn't make it because there was no such thing as a deconversion, and that I had life's reconversion to attend. If you stay late enough, I'm sure you'll see the ones in the bathroom deliriously shaving with blades from hole punches and clipping their nails with stapler removers. Their shadows are sluggish and they don't stand a chance. Punched out, my five o'clock shadow bobs and weaves, sword drawn, wondering what ideal it was giving up on and which one it was still fighting for and whether they were ever different from one another. I've got a few more. This is called a bed that moved whichever way you wanted it to. Every Sunday, I used to get off the E-train and go to the old-fashioned ice cream parlor around the corner for a vanilla shake with a cherry on top. My growing gut was proof I was an avid fan, but I truly became a connoisseur when I had my tonsils removed. After the surgery, I knew a small part of me was missing, but I didn't know what it looked like, and I didn't ask. My recovery room was on the third floor, and I shared it with three older men who sat like vultures and who each had the same look on his face. For me, it was like one of those Saturdays where the whole house is left to you. No school for two days, a wealth in toys, a bed that moved whichever way you wanted it to, and all the shakes one could drink. Each time I would let the cherry sit on top of the whipped cream like a bird's egg, resting in its nest until it too sat alone at the bottom, slightly wrinkled from dehydration. I bet the cherry wondered how it got to the bottom so quick. 
Then I would try to suck the cherry right through the straw as if my lungs were machines. It was impossible, but that didn't stop me from trying. My hope would swell as I sat patiently awaiting the nurse and her metal mail cart whose rusty wheels would slowly squeak down the hallway like a parade of trumpeting mice announcing the Sheikh's arrival. As if the tube in his mouth was a vacuum cleaner, slowly sucking out his balls through his slightly wrinkled cherry red cheeks. Every Sunday, I get off the E train and get a vanilla shake. This is a poem I wrote after going out to Brockton's very own Chang Chung. <laughs> um, 21st century fortune cookie. Sitting in this plump, circular, half sea green, half tail plastic booth, which most certainly looks as if it was plucked directly from a 70s porno set, I crunch in this half vanilla, half chocolate 21st century fortune cookie. It reads, the shock of high prices lasts longer than the memory of bad quality. <laughs> How am I supposed to keep a little faith when even the clairvoyants are making excuses and giving up? <laughs> Bogged down by the booming sounds of bottled butterflies and nervous breakdowns, this place is a landmine. These next two are about terrible TV um, that I sometimes find myself watching. Um, first one is called Brand New Culture. Pow, bam, fire-breathing dragon. We want you to celebrate the Chinese New Year. Commercials for cupcakes are now insulting our dignity. Last night I dreamt television was on trial for hate crimes, but no one could find the judge and his IP address showed no activity. Lost somewhere between a Twitter feed and a bootleg copy of a movie yet written, pundits and fans alike don't want to see TV behind bars, but only because no one believes in rehabilitation. Besides, babysitters are so expensive these days. Dying to relive his childhood, he sits alone at a hotel desk with a pad of construction paper and a box of Crayola crayons, and he crafts himself the finest damn suicide note ever posted on Facebook. I'm surprised it took me this long to start sweating. <laughs> all right, I got two left for you. This is called, It's All My Fault. This desk from college splattered with paint, it's all my fault, it's still here. The excuses that fill each staple hole, all me. Each follicle of hair which has trickled down from my receding hairline one for each hour wasted on the internet. It's my fault they're so thin. It's my fault a favorites page bookmark has replaced my actual dictionary. Spell check hasn't ruined me. Computers haven't ruined me. My reliance has ruined me. I watch television about young brunette teens who get to visit other countries and sincerely ponder out loud, have they ever seen people? I can blame her. I can insinuate that her ilk are the reason for my disconnect, but it's not her fault I haven't changed the channel. I thought Peru was an island, she said, and yet we still yearn and ache for things like female, age, and other drop-down menus. All right, last one here. Um, I wrote this during my last anxiety attack. Um, <laughs> It's called Omron Blues. On a night when blood pressure tests are needed to coax sleep, and your pipe looks like a skull in the dark, and you're thankful for passing gas because it's a way to center your focus, <laughs> never forget that you are trying. On a night when the pressure in your head feels like the right boil on the inside of your thigh that detonated earlier that day, still raw and bruised, Make sure to tell yourself that even self-inflicted wounds heal. On a night when you feel entirely removed from your body, as you stare blankly at yourself in the bathroom at 3 a.m. pondering if this is your black mirror moment, remember bad feelings are still feelings, and you couldn't comprehend that were it not for the presence of good.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, just to let you know, Thursday at 4.02 p.m., I received a text from Lou. It's right here. And it says, just to let you know, my stuff ain't always that uplifting. <laughs> but I think we can all agree that Lou's and Nyla's, we were all uplifted. So I want to invite you back next month, December 21st, the third Saturday of the month, same time, same room. And our features will be Kenya McDonald uh, from Randolph, English literary, literacy teacher. Um, and Nicole Roach is our student feature. And she's a sophomore at UMass Lowell. So we're going to wind up. I want to thank the Brockton Library for giving us the space, Director Paul Engel for setting all this up, General Manager of Brockton Access TV, Mark Lindy, for recording this for future broadcasts. And if you see him, if you want to talk to him, he can tell you how to um, watch it um, either on cable or YouTube. I want to thank all the people on the open mic. Thank you for your words, for your truth. Um, Nyla, Lewis, and I want to especially thank everyone who came to listen. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much.